22nd Corrington Award Ceremony. At this time, I'll ask that you silence your phones and other devices. I'll also take this opportunity to remind Centenary students that passport points are available for this event. There are QR codes on the way out if you didn't catch them on the way in. The John Williams Corrington Award for Literary Excellence is presented annually by the Department of English at Centenary on behalf of the Centenary student body and faculty to an established, critically acknowledged writer. This award honors a Centenary alumnus and English major, Bill Corrington, who was variously an English professor, an attorney in private practice, and with his wife, Joyce, the head writer for several television shows, including Search for Tomorrow and General Hospital. A prolific poet, he also published four novels, two short novels, and three collections of short stories. The Corrington Award presentation is generously supported by a donation from the Corrington family and by the Attaway Professorships in Civic Culture. On behalf of the college and my colleagues in the English department, I'd also like to thank the Convocations Committee, Facility Services, Marketing and Communication, the Office of Student Involvement, and the Theater Department, especially Alan Berry, for their contributions to this evening's event. Here to introduce this year's award winner is Dr. Jefferson Hendricks, Chair of the English Department, and George A. Wilson, Eminent Scholars and Dow Chair of American Literature. Thank you, Bali. Uh, I would also like to thank a few people. Uh, any event like this is uh, not done easily, and it's done with teamwork, and a lot of you are uh, on teams, our work in teams, and you know what that means. And, and so I'm very proud of the English department and our alums and emeriti, such as Dr. David Haddard, who uh, initiated this award back in 1991. Uh, I'd like to thank Steve Shelburne, who designed the wonderful box that contains the medal that we'll be giving to our recipient tonight, designed by Art Department Emeritus Bruce Allen. Um, I'd like to thank the whole English department who make this event happen. Uh, provost, assistant provost, our associate provost, I never get that right, Jeannie Hamming, and English department uh, professor, uh, along with Belie Jones Pierce and her wonderful introduction, Matthew Blasey, Rachel Johnson. Um, Meg Sanders and Chrissy Martin, among other people. And also, uh, very nice to see our uh, absent professor this year return. And uh, I would like to uh, welcome Dr. Lighthouser back to sit there. It's good to see you, Emily. Um, I'd like to thank the provost for coming out on a rather dreary night, and indeed thank all of you for coming out on a dreary night, even if your English professors kept that proverbial shotgun at your head, uh, <laughs> you still responded to it, and that's, that's wise and good. So, our 2022-23 recipient of the Corrington Award, our 33rd recipient going back to 1991 with Eudora Welty is Mary Jo Salter, born 1954, a Michigan native, raised in Michigan and Baltimore and educated at Harvard and Cambridge universities. Most recently, a professor in the writing seminars at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, one of the leading creative writing programs in the nation. Professor Salter is a poet, lyricist, editor, playwright, and essay essayist. And we look forward, Professor Salter, now that you may have a bit more time on your hands, to any short stories and novels that you may be contemplating. Mary Jo, like Bill Quarantin, you are indeed prolific. You have published nine books of poetry, a play, children's book, numerous essays and reviews, have been an editor of the Atlantic Monthly, The New Republic, and one of the most widely used literary anthologies in college education, the Norton Anthology of Poetry. But like few others, you 
are a poet that brings to us a celebrated formal beauty in its acute attention to the often joyful complexity of everyday life. As I've written to you already, like your concierge, we too want to be like that. Like you, we believe, quote, seeing is the keenest praise. And we believe your poetry helps us see in a way we never have before. We do disagree a bit, as I've mentioned to you. However, in one way, we believe you can absolutely compete with Mina, Carol, and Paulette. Have to read Video Blues to get that reference. But like Bill Quarantine, perhaps surprisingly for people that may know you, you are a rebel in your own way. Your poetry rebels against fake news and alternative facts. Your poetry speaks of a beauty in the everyday strivings of the human imagination. And without condescension or sentimentality, represents a poetic sensibility that can help us read the world as it is. And as William Faulkner says of the literary artist, you can help us not only survive, but thrive. And for this, we thank you. Mary Jo Salter, for all that we thank you for and your visit here, we would like to honor you as the 33rd recipient of the John William Corrington Award for Literary Excellence. We have a wonderful medal here in a beautifully designed box. Um, the medal was designed by local artist Clyde Connell, and we have a book about Clyde Connell, daughter of the Bayou. And um, we hope that your visit to Louisiana will be less wet <laughs> next time or even later tomorrow. Uh, but thank you so much for letting us honor you tonight. Thank you, John. you get to know more and more about the past because you were there. 
And, um, but at the same time, the future seems to be coming at you faster and faster, and other people understand it better, in a sense, because they're making the future in a, way, in a slightly different way. So some of, my, some of my poems have to do with that, and specifically, I've, I've, I've often been interested in the role of technology <clears throat> and the changes in technology in making us feel that time is moving very fast or that life is changing. So I think I'll start with a, a poem that starts my most recent book, Zoom Rooms. And I knew when I got this message from my computer that I was going to have to write a poem about it. Uh, the title runs into the first line. Your session has timed out due to inactivity. Do you want to reboot back to your nativity? Too bad, you can't go back, or forward for that matter. Remember running track, dunking a basketball, or come to think of it, doing anything at all? Too bad, you can't reboot. In fact, the very terms you use will soon be moot will take their downward spiral like you to a black hole while brave new words go viral. Assuming being active or inactive is a thing in the future, or to live. I think I'm just going to take out my watch so I have a sense of time here, speaking of time. Um, Okay, so I thought I would read next from the title poem of the book. And um, I wrote it in the midst of the pandemic, as I was saying to some students this morning. Uh, the idea of writing about Zoom is partly just that it was so consuming when we all suddenly, I as a teacher, most of you as students, had to learn and learn a new technology. But I remember looking at my students on this Zoom screen and thinking everybody's a square and it makes up, they're all individuals but we've made this other ge geometric form which is, you know, a, a rectangle with rectangles. And it reminded me of sonnets and the way that each, each sonnet is a kind of expression of one thing, which is to say the personality of that of that sonnet. Um, and so I, I, I wrote a series, and some of these sonnets are themselves a Zoom um, experience, and others are sort of about it. I'm going to read from the beginning and the end. It's a, it's a pretty long poem, so I don't want to read the whole thing. But I'll sort of pause, and you'll know at, when a sonnet is finished. So I'll start at the beginning. Zoom rooms. Followers and friends and participants gallery view, which speaker view supplants, meeting attendants who for now are mute or worse, unmute, a word I might dispute even exists, whether verb or adjective. Is this life, is this how you want to live? Nose scratches broadcast, thoughts shrunk to an icon or two, clap, thumbs up, and if you leave your mic on while others talk, your faintest sign framed in gold light like a vanity mirror. Named on your little tile, you can't slip out unseen. Self-surveyed, your eye contact on screen seems off. Don't look at people. Focus where the tiny camera is that proves you're there. Book bookcase prop and real or fake bouquet behind you well-dressed only to the waist, as if in a casket, top half on display. Here's another weirdness to be faced. You're in the gallery. You're shown as one of your own satellites, as if the sun were both a planet and the Copernican magnet for all planets. Yes, I can undo all this and activate the hide self feature. Where was that again? It's hidden nearly as neatly as the moon's dark side but that's like suicide. It feels forbidden now that I'm linked to the beloved spectator who is myself, light source and shadowed crater. Here, as professor, I host, enable the waiting room, 
and one by one admit my students etherized around a table in the platonic classroom where they sit or recline in bed. Protest this? I don't dare. Full roster. Nobody's ill. Smile and wave hello, a new habit. Can you hear me? Share screen, clicking a doc I thought to save to desktop on my laptop. This is normal. Mixed metaphors, a new term we have chosen ourselves. Whether our verse was free or formal, we thought we were free thinkers. Oops, you're frozen, we're bound to say. We sign on for more jargon. Paste in the password, try to join again. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. By the time these sonnets fit into a book, blocks on a page, an old technology happily unremarkable as the pre-pandemic world, how odd will it look that we're solid flesh again? Someday soon, the few corporeal beings we dare see, grocery clerks and nurses, EMT drivers, the essential Amazon delivery guys who ring the bell and run, the letter carriers who bear their worry as to what spiky cells home bodies carry, will be everyone. Reader, you took the vaccine. You threw away your masks, your hugging, kissing. As for your avatar, is that you missing your mirror image mirage? Do you schedule more meetings to screen like movies? Do you tell friends you could fl safely fly to see that travel is, what with climate change, an ethical problem after all? Think of the solitary walks you used to take. Though you were wary of other walkers and stepped into the street unspeaking as they approached, an etiquette of mandatory rudeness, have you found yourself less patient now that there's more sound? Loud diners, children, and nowhere a mute button. So much else from the old days you'd forgotten and might sacrifice if that were possible. People, basically, and meeting for all. Um, I'm still feeling it, I don't know about you, even though we're back to normal, uh, it feels strange and wonderful to be in a room with a lot of people. And, um, but I think it, it affected all of us and we don't even know quite um, how it will have affected us. We need a few more years to think it through, it seems to me. Anyway, I now want to write, uh, to read more about just ordinary life and real people and, and not Zoom people. Um, how's the microphone? Is it? it yeah, it fell, yeah. Oh, okay. I wonder if it had changed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and could you hear me before? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's a little better. I can, I can hear it myself. Is that all right? Yeah. Good. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Okay, so uh, let's see. So I'm going to read uh, a poem about my own childhood, and specifically about my mother, who died many years ago. It's called Hot Water Bottle. Did this just go down again? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Hot Water Bottle. You're so long dead, and the days when you tended your teenage daughter go back so far that the two of us seem equally prehistoric. But today, for some reason or none, which happens more and more often, you resurfaced like those secret stabs in the gut I'd have to endure at school. I always forgot how bad it was until another month had passed. I always forgot I'd need you again to soothe me, home from the wars at last, with a cup of tea and a vaguely vulva-like red rubber hot water bottle. You'd make sure the bottle stopper was dialed tight as an oven timer. An electric heating pad would have done the trick, but you preferred to be on call when the scalding bottle cooled, to shovel back to the kitchen unplug the thing and empty it in the sink, glug, glug, and start again. You lived to see the birth of my first daughter, but not the second. That time my water broke all at once, streamed down my legs, 
flooded the front of my thin spring skirt as I stood barefoot on the grass, happy and afraid. Somebody left on earth should know that when I was young, you doted on me. I'd lie on the couch, hot water bottle on my flat abdomen and watch TV. A rerun of the red balloon, I'm thinking now. One time, I know it was that. Whenever it was, I saw it. I remember the tug of wishing I could catch the bobbing string for the boy as his red balloon drifted away. Okay, that was about my childhood, and now I'm going to embarrass my daughter in the audience by reading one about hers. Um, we have a long tradition of my embarrassing her poetry readings. <laughs> <clears throat> this is called Man Barbies. <laughs> Man Barbies. That's how my two daughters referred to their two Kens. Just two of them, among the legions of leggy, big-haired Barbies, each of whom went to bed alone and had plenty of room in her own sedan-shaped box of Kleenex. One by one, not meaning to skew the ultimate balance of the sexes, I bought girl dolls for birthdays and Christmases, or because it was nobody's birthday or holiday, but my girls wanted something new. Me too. I tired of hacked off hairdos after the games of beauty parlor of tiny high heels without a mate, of permanently tiptoed feet smeared in nail polish like bloody excuses for shoes. Yet rarely did buying a fresh Ken seem any sort of solution. And since man Barbies didn't even care what they wore, why get them extra clothes? <laughs> Besides, my girls were clearly growing too old for dolls. I was shocked one day to overhear a Barbie had had an abortion. <laughs> Which Ken had been the father? Or was that even a question? Man Barbies were an enigma. Maybe each Ken was a token husband for my girls themselves, in which, in which case there mustn't be more. Could it be that one Man Barbie stood for their dad and the other for the brother they'd never had? Too much interpretation, surely. <laughs> My daughters liked girl Barbies being girly, which meant they chose one day to sashay out as women in their own Barbie heels and looked around amazed, as I had once. How many man Barbies were out there, each of them wanting something new? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm going to change um, tack altogether. I know that Centenary has a program in Paris, and that a lot of you have either, either traveled there or will be. And I met several French students today, and I think that's just wonderful that you have this um, exchange. Um, so I'm going to read two poems set in Paris. The first one is called A Rainbow Over the Seine. And I also chose it just because it's raining today. <laughs> A rainbow over the Seine. Noiseless at first, a spray of mist in the face, a nosegay of moisture never destined to be a downpour. Until the sodden cloud banks suddenly empty into the Seine with a loud clap, then a falling ovation for the undrenchable sun, which goes on shining our shoes while they're filling like open boats and the sails of our newspaper hats are flagging. And seeing that nobody thought to bring an umbrella puts up a rainbow instead. A rainbow over the sin, perfectly wrought as a drawbridge dreamed by a child in crayon. And by the law of dreams, the connection once made can only be lost. Not being children, we stand above the grate of the metro we're not taking, thunder underfoot, and soak up what we know. The triumph of this arc-en-ciel, the dazzle of this monumental prism cut by drizzle, is that it vanishes. Here's another short one. Um, and it's based 
on a true experience, which is that I was standing on a, uh, at, in a street in Paris and saw two very beautiful people, and I'll tell you a little bit about that after I read the poem. Boulevard du Montparnasse. Once in a doorway in Paris, I saw the most beautiful couple in the world. They were each the single most beautiful thing in the world. She would have been 16, perhaps, he 20. Their skin was the same shade of black, like a shiny Steinway. And they stood there like the four-legged instrument of a passion so grand one could barely imagine them ever working or eating or reading a magazine. Even they could hardly believe it. Her hands gripped his belt loops as they found each other's eyes. Because beauty like this must be held onto, could easily run away on the power of his long, lean thighs or the tiny feet of her laughter. I thought, now I will write a poem set in a doorway on the Boulevard de Bonparnasse in which the brutishness of time rates only a mention, I will say simply that if either one should ever love another, a greater beauty shall not be the cause. So I meant that entirely sincerely, but there was a funny thing that happened. As I looked across the street and saw these people, I said to my friend, look, there's the most beautiful woman in the world. And she said, yes, yeah, she is. She's an internationally famous model. <laughs> um, okay. So we've been talking about travel a little bit. Um, here's, here's sort of anywhere. It's any train station. Um, you've seen this scene at any train station. It's called, whoa, sorry about that. It's called Goodbye Train. I'm stepping off the train behind a pair of 30-somethings with their baby daughter. The father will stay fit for years, I think, though here and there his hair is a little thin. The mother's confident in new blue jeans she knows are sexy, but carefully tastefully so. Seeing them floods me at once, I can't say why, with solicitude, delight, and envy, pain. Goodbye, train, the mother says, and then, say goodbye, train, bye-bye. She waves her hand theatrically, the way we often will with children, so that nobody can find us guilty ourselves of any silliness of joy in the trainman's cap, his ticket punch. The little girl is propped on her father's hip and pointing vaguely at a world of things she's just come to know and which now must go away. How brave she seems, a toothless oracle. I see, too, how I look if anyone's looking, a weathered niceness, a trudging competence. That's how I follow, 20 years ahead of the parents, as I lug my bags behind them, vowing to keep a stranger's proper distance, as I did from those two lovesick teenagers clinging in tears some stations back, when he prepared himself to be left there on the platform by a girl who swore it wasn't possible, and both were stunned to discover that it was. I think what luck it is to be one who says goodbye to trains instead of other people. I haven't written very much about Baltimore, where I live, where I spent much of my childhood and now have spent much of my adulthood having come back. Um, but I'm going to read one poem that doesn't mention Baltimore, but it's, it's a scene that many of us would know. Because if you're called up for jury duty, you are, you are asked to sit for however long in the War Memorial Building. Unfortunately, there are so many wars, we never know which war they're memorializing. <laughs> this one was World War I. And so you'll hear a reference or two to battles in World War I. Um, and 
we talked a little bit in classes today about how we come up with forms. This was a made up form and I didn't know I was going to do it until I kept doing it, which is to say a long line and a short line. That's the stanza and then another long line and a short line. But I found myself ending everything, virtually every line, with ing. And I think maybe why I did that was that I was waiting. There is just this process of being in, you know, it is a continuous process, waiting. And so that's sort of the form behind the content. Jury duty. In the great hall of the War Memorial Building, the jurors are waiting. They're on folding chairs and wearing their sticker badges. It's all so boring sitting there till your number's up, not knowing if you'll be serving at all, and if so, for weeks on end or a day. That in the beginning, some of them find themselves leaning back and squinting to read the engravings, Ms. Argon, 79th Division, on the massive moldings lining the 30-foot ceiling, although by now, the words mean nothing. Most people are checking their phones, not many books. One woman is chuckling at a cat video in her palm, and one old fellow who was neatly folding and unfolding his actual physical newspaper gets up. He's walking along the polished marble walls to study the bronze plates listing by county for easy reference by family members, not one still living. All the dead doughboys of the state. He stops, he reads, keeps going. And now, forced television. A football movie about guys grunting and slamming helmet to helmet. Then there's one, if you aren't looking, when the opening credits run or are hard of hearing, which seems to be something about the Nazis until the special effects confirm you're watching Captain America a futuristic soldier from the past of cartooning. Even the most resistant among the jurors get, are caught consulting the exploding screen now and then. After a while, they all are paying so much attention, the clerk seems rude to call them. He's interrupting. It's time he escorted some jurors across the street to another looming old edifice, the colonnaded courthouse its white face baking impartially in the sun. Fresh air, the jurors can't help rejoicing. A man sleeps on a bench. Past a boarded up shop, some trash is blowing. The jurors are still happy. They'll never complain again, they're thinking, if they can get off. On such a nice day, who would opt to spoil it hearing about people hurting each other? or to have to say which ones are guilty. Okay, let's see, I'm going to read um, one more poem that ostensibly is about travel, but it's really about our own past. It's called Wake up call. The water is slapping, wake up, wake up, against the boat chugging away from Venice. Infinite essence of what must end because it is beautiful. Venice that shrinks to a bobbing, pungent postcard, and then to nothing at all as the automatic doors at the airport obligingly shut behind you. Re-enter a world where everything is much the same, where you've gone slack again and don't even know it. So unaware that you actually shrug to yourself, I'll be back. And yes, for some lucky stiffs, it's true. Sometimes it's you. You're sure to get more chances at Venice and Paris and that unblessed, un and that blessed unmarked place where you sat on a bench and he kissed you that first time. So many kisses you hoped he would never stop. You can hope, at least, not ever to forget it. Or forget how your babies latching onto your breast would roll up their eyes in an ecstasy that was comic in its seriousness 
but we rejoice was no less grave. But you're not going back to so much. And more and more, the longer you live, there's more not to go back to. And what you demand in your gratitude and greed is more life in which to get so attached to something, someone, or someplace. You're sure you'll die right then when you can't have it back. Something you don't even know the name of yet, but will be yours before receding as an indispensable ache. What you're saying is, Lord, surprise me with even more to miss. Okay, I'm going to finish with um, one short poem and one longer one. Um, All the older people you know say that they're beginning to forget names. That's just what happens. This is called forgetting names. Inevitable and not too shaming that I forget long in years as I am. Some familiar name for a moment or two. But waking now, it occurs to me something worse is already on its way. The perfectly normal day that nobody anywhere no tip of any tongue, will even think of trying to call me up from the vast data cache of the past. The forgotten name is mine. Well, I had said in that old poem, written quite a few years ago, um, that what you want in your gratitude and greed is something you don't even know the name of yet that will feel indispensable for you. And for me, I found out what that was. That was my granddaughter, Lena. Didn't know her name, didn't know she was in my future. So this new book ends with a poem to her. And in it, you will hear references to the pandemic, oblique references to that, and references to the summer of 2020. She was born in 2020, and um, there were, of course, um, the, the election was going on. There were um, Black Lives Matter demonstrations going on. There was, uh, there was all sorts of turmoil that was also perhaps hopeful. And so we were all turned up that summer. And that was the summer in which I got to know Lena a little better. I didn't see as much of her as I wanted to because it was a pandemic. So I'll end with this, and thank you for listening so so nicely, and, and thank you for this wonderful award. A letter to Lena. I came when you were born, but soon the flying stopped. By the time I came again, we drove in, in private cars and masked our public faces like bandits bent on crimes that had already happened. Once home, We'd wash our hands of greed and disregard, while in the streets, more fists were raised against long years of violent injustice. Born into an era possibly too late to salvage the green earth a virus has made sure you've barely seen so far. Born amidst decline of all sorts, when the rule of idiocy emerged finally as malice and patience that slim virtue of the citizen exposed the privilege of guilt. You, O oh wide-eyed girl, have joined that ancient global club of generations whose first days seem our last. Civilizations do end, and there's no reason we shouldn't be the ones to close out the whole series. We're halfway out the door now, a techno-human species, is it too much to hope, though, you'll get a whole life in? I'm thinking more in days at the moment. How many days do I get to spend with you before we must pick, pack up and drive with some unclear motive back to the spot we are supposed to stay? Why leave you, anyway? Nothing sweeter than waking and waiting for you to wake. Breast milk in your belly, 
you wriggle and coo and kick and smile and smile at us as if we were the prime source of infectious joy. But that's you, of course. Remember, I keep saying inside my head, because I have words. Remember this, Lena at three months. I got to give you a bottle. I got to fondle your feet. And it's all a replay from the lost days I recall when your mother was this new. I got to have it twice, her and her sister. Then a third time, I got you. How could such floods of love not add up to enough? Yet I hardly tried at all to make this old world better. What I made was dinner and poems when I could. Dear child in a bassinet, who tries and tries and can't quite roll over yet. Grow to turn your mind to the desperate demands of your time. Choose to be glad to change, not to wait and see. I'm changed by you already. I want to be around more keenly than before, to live because you're living. When you have words, I'll listen. Tell me what I'm missing when you come to visit me. Thank you.